98, what's the address of the emergency? Uh, yes, um, I'm on the Metro Link train. We just left uh, North Ridge, I mean, Jasper Station, heading towards the city. We had a collision with something. We have a whole bunch of people who are now bleeding and on the floor. Is that train? It's the Metro Link train. Okay, did, can you give me uh, an intersection or some something close to... Uh... Well, we're almost at the... In the shadowy realm of the unexplained, few phenomena are as chilling as the concept of receiving a telephone call from beyond the grave. In 1979, parapsychologists D. Scott Rogo and Raymond Bayless delved into this eerie subject in their groundbreaking book, Phone Calls from the Dead. This book explores the unsettling notion that the dead can reach out to the living through the technology we use every day. Could it be that spirits manipulate the very devices we rely on to communicate? Rogo and Bayless documented numerous cases where individuals reported receiving calls from deceased loved ones. These calls often occurred shortly after the person's death, leaving the recipients in a state of shock and disbelief. Imagine picking up the phone and hearing nothing but static, or perhaps a voice you recognize, a voice that shouldn't be speaking. This is the terrifying reality faced by those who have experienced these ghostly calls. The phenomenon of phone calls from the dead is closely linked to electronic voice phenomena, or EVP. It's believed that spirits might manipulate electromagnetic fields to create these calls, though the exact mechanism remains a mystery. Skeptics argue that these calls can often be explained by technical malfunctions or the power of suggestion. Our minds are adept at finding patterns, especially in random stimuli. All right, we have huge breaking news going on right now. This is a live picture from Air 7 HD in Chatsworth. We're getting word that two trains have collided, one of them a Metrolink train that apparently had passengers aboard, in fact, quite a few. Let's start out now with uh, Air 7 HD and Bill Thomas, who's overhead. Bill. Yeah, just chaos over here. We're in Chatsworth right now, the northwest end of the San Fernando Valley. This is a Metrolink and a freight train that have somehow collided here. You can see that everything's burst into flames. Both trains have been derailed from the tracks. We're still trying to find out from firefighters just how many people have been injured, but it's going to take quite a while. You can see all the carnage here. I haven't seen anything this bad since that huge Atwater Village train crash we had from several years ago. There's the three trains right now from uh, Metrolink on the right. On the left, there's the freight train, and you can see they've all just slammed together and been derailed. Uh, firefighters are here right now. They're trying to douse the flames, and then in time. Let's go to the right now. Let's go to the Amtrak, uh, make that the uh, Metrolink train. In time, firefighters will have to get on board each one of those trains. There's the first one, two more behind it. After they get the flames out, they'll have to go inside and check on everybody's status and try to get everybody out that needs rescuing as soon as possible. Again, we don't know how many people were on that Metrolink train or how the accident happened, but this will take quite a while for firefighters not only to douse the flames, but find out how many people have been injured, how seriously they've been injured, and then at one point they'll have to set up a bit of a triage here and uh, treat everyone who's been injured. Once again, this is in the northwest end of the San Fernando Valley. This is on the Metrolink track right by Tanga Canyon, a little below the Ronald Reagan freeway near the 118. This is a heavily populated residential area as well, so one of the things we're trying to figure out is if there's any toxic chemicals on board that freight train, and in time we may have to find out that the neighborhood here below where the train crash happened, there may be some evacuation. So uh, let's go back to the flames there. Uh, that one's still bursting into flames. They haven't got the flames out just yet. And as soon as we find out more from firefighters, we'll get right back to you. For now, we'll keep the helicopter overhead. For the remainder of the afternoon, we'll keep you updated as frequently as possible. On September 12, 2008, a catastrophic event unfolded in the quiet neighborhood of Chatsworth, Los Angeles. A collision so devastating, it would forever change the landscape of rail safety in America. At precisely 4.22 p.m., a Metrolink commuter train, carrying unsuspecting passengers home for the weekend, collided head-on with a Union Pacific freight train. The crash site was a curved section of single track, just east of Stony Point, where both trains were traveling at over 40 miles per hour. The impact was immediate and catastrophic. Twenty-five lives were lost, including the Metrolink engineer, Robert M. Sanchez. Over 100 others were injured, many critically, as the twisted metal and shattered glass bore witness to the horror of that day. The emergency response was swift, yet the scale of the disaster overwhelmed local resources. First responders described the scene as beyond human description, a haunting tableau of destruction and despair. 
Robert M. Sanchez was the 47-year-old engineer of the Metrolink commuter train that collided head-on with a Union Pacific freight train in Chatsworth, California, on September 12, 2008. Sanchez was killed in the crash, along with 24 other people. Investigators found that Sanchez had been texting while operating the train, including sending a message just 22 seconds before the collision. This violated Metrolink's policy prohibiting cell phone use by engineers. Phone records showed Sanchez had made plans via text to allow a teenage train enthusiast friend to operate the locomotive, which was against regulations. Sanchez had been caught with a cell phone in the train cab previously by his supervisors. He failed to stop at a red signal, which led to the collision with the freight train on the single track section. Sanchez had worked as a Metrolink engineer since 1996 and previously worked for Amtrak from 1998 to 2005. Neighbors described Sanchez as reclusive, but he was popular among young train enthusiasts who would greet him as he passed by. The crash led to new federal regulations banning cell phone use by rail workers and requiring the implementation of positive train control technology. Sanchez's actions and the resulting crash became a major focus of NTSB hearings and investigations into rail safety practices. Among the 25 who perished was Charles E. Peck, a man whose story would haunt his loved ones and perplex investigators. Charles Peck was a man with dreams of a new life. He had traveled to Los Angeles for a job interview, hoping to relocate and marry his fiancée, Andrea Katz. But fate had other plans. The crash left families devastated and communities in shock. Yet, amidst the chaos, a chilling mystery began to unfold. For 12 hours after the crash, Charles Peck's cell phone became a beacon of hope and despair. It made 35 calls to his loved ones, his fiancée, his son, his siblings. Each time they answered, they were met with nothing but static. She says they might have looked like an odd couple. Andrea Katz is six foot one. Chuck Peck was five seven. But she says they were made for each other. They've been friends for 20 years, and after his divorce a couple of years ago, their friendship turned to love. She was on her way to pick him up from the Metrolink station when she heard the news on the radio. She knew immediately he was on that train. But was he alive? And then they got the first call. It was to Chuck's son in Utah. And he said, my dad just called me. And I said, what did he say? Where is he? Is he okay? It, it, he didn't say anything. The phone rang and it said, Dad. They watched the tormenting search for survivors, certain that Chuck was alive and trapped in the wreckage. Between Chuck's kids and other family members, about three dozen calls were made from Chuck's phone. But there was only static and silence. And then almost five hours after the collision, at 9.08... Andrea got a call. And we were yelling in the phone, you know, hang in there, baby. They, you know, we're going to get you out. You're going to be okay. It was the hope they needed. And when the rescue efforts were about to turn to recovery, there was another call. And that prompted search crews to trace it. It was coming from the first train. So they went back in one last time. And they were so excited. They had this incredible adrenaline rush at the thought that they could possibly go find another survivor. And we gave her a description, and they spent the next couple of hours looking for him. And um, they did end up finding him, and they said that he had died immediately on impact, and there was no way he could have been calling us. She believes those phone calls got them through the night and helped them find Chuck's body. The intellectual side of my brain thinks, gee, it was a computer malfunction, and the emotional side of my brain it was just Chuck letting us know that he knew that we were scared for him and letting us have hope. And she's also comforted by the fact that they were happy, ready to get married and start their new life together. She believes he was riding that train with a smile. He died instantly and he didn't suffer. And when you love somebody, you couldn't ask for a better way for them to leave this life just happy and excited and didn't see it coming. And they may never find out exactly how those calls were made because Chuck's phone was never found. Reporting from News Center, Lynette Romero, back to you in the studio. Theories abound. Was it a technological glitch? A damaged phone cycling through contacts? Or was there something more sinister? Something supernatural at play? Phones can malfunction, especially in traumatic events. But the precision of these calls targeting only his closest family, 
raises questions that technology alone cannot answer. The mystery of Charles Peck's phone calls remains unsolved. A chilling reminder of the thin veil between life and death, and the echoes that linger in the aftermath of tragedy. Thank you for joining us on this unsettling journey. If you found this story particularly haunting, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share your thoughts below. Until next time, stay curious and keep questioning the unknown.